Welcome to Fahrenheit 140. Why 140? It's the temperature that water burns after six seconds. I'm Robert Mace. And I'm Carrie Thompson. And we're the Fahrenheit 140 co-hosts covering the news you need to know about climate change in Texas. So Carrie, it's, it's, it's been a while since we've talked. I was shocked when I was looking to see when the last time it was we recorded a show. And I, I'm honestly absolutely shocked it was over a year ago. Yeah. What happened to the year last well, year? Well, I'm, I'm shocked that they invited us back for season two, <laughs> to be honest. I guess, you know, the people were clamoring. Uh, bring yeah. us back. Bring them back. Bring them back. So, <laughs> so here we are. So here we are. Here we are. And not only are we back. But we're kicking it off with a special Earth Day episode here at the Meadow Center at Spring Lake, the headwaters of the beautiful San Marcos River. And and we're also um, being produced. True. Yes. True. Yes. We have like the real deal equipment. So hopefully we sound better. You sound fantastic. Do I? Oh, so do you. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> well, we're going to do our usual thing today and talk about, we, we actually only have two articles today. We're saving a little time. And then we're going to interview some of our friends and partners that are here with us today at Earth Day. We're going to get to talk to Blue Triton Brands. Some of you uh, good Texans might know them better as Ozarka. They're sponsoring our stage today, so we're going to get to spend some time with them. We're going to talk to the Texas State University Office of Sustainability and the Deputy Director of Spring Lake Education is Miranda Waite, and we get to talk to both of them today. Each time we meet with y'all, we're going to bring an article or two that kind of gets you up to speed on some of the emerging topics and climate change. And then uh, we promise to leave you with something cheerful and a good reason to stay optimistic about these challenges that we're facing. So, Robert, you're up first. Sure. What so, you got? so first up, I've got something that's uh, near and dear to my heart. You know, it's, it's interesting how climate change expresses itself in different ways and sometimes surprising where you're, where you're like you wouldn't think climate change would pop up and and this article came out recently um, by grist that ties kitten season to a warming climate k-i-t-t-e-n kitten yes oh and, and look at that sweet little baby oh my on goodness the, yeah oh. just to describe it's a cute baby kitten <laughs> looks like its eyes have been open maybe two days oh and it's just it's just looking for a hug. It's just looking for a hug. And carbon reducing uh, <laughs> policy. <laughs> um, the uh, the Humane Society of America um, calls kitten season natural disaster. Um, oh wow! Because I guess in part, sadly, there's not enough home for the kitties. Right. Um, and so, and so you just suddenly get flooded with all these kittens. And then, as much as I I love cats. I have eight. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a cat person, Carrie? I mean, of course I am, Robert. <laughs> I don't have eight cats, though. But <laughs> Why is your fingers crossed? <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the news? So there's going to be a longer season? Well, oh, yeah. yeah. Kitten season? Was, sorry. Get talking about cats. I, I know. Just, he's I completely get distracted. distracted. <laughs> yes, this is, that's cute. I don't know if it has a name or not. Um, so it's Patrick Fallon, but that might just be the person who took the photo. <laughs> um, but Patrick, little Patty there, looks just adorable but i guess yeah. the news is that with with warmer temperatures kitten season is coming earlier mm -hmm. and it's also lasting longer which means you know more kittens mm -hmm. and there's there already is a struggle of, of finding homes for for all the kitties the homeless kitties that are out there i'm gonna cry oh gosh oh gosh so that's definitely the downer article <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've got a, I've got a more, I've got a, an uplifting one about oh. wildfire later. To, oh, good, oh, <laughs> to good. Bring up. I look forward to that. Um, <laughs> but, but I think the, yeah, maybe maybe one carry away from this topic is uh, problem is there's just a lot of cats, straight cats out there. So, did it offer any solutions? Um, um, don't burn so much carbon dioxide. <laughs> Cats for climate cats, policy. Cats for climate policy. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It's just uh, it's just it's just one of these consequences tough, of yeah. warming, you know, and it's tied to warming. And uh, and if the warming gets worse, um, you know, it, it could make things 
even worse going yeah. forward. So, and then and then there's the consequences that come with that as well. Can you take sixteen cats? Can you double up? No, oh. um, just like that. Just like that show I used to watch in the eighties. Eight is enough. <laughs> Actually, eight is too much. I don't recommend it. Um, but everybody should rush out. And yeah, do what they can. Adopt the kitty. Well, yeah. Bless you for what you've done for the kitties. Thanks for letting us know. You're welcome. <laughs> Another um, related, I mean, I think that's, it's it's a bit of a downer to talk about these things, but I think it's really important for us to try on, like, what is this going to mean for our day-to-day lives, right? So um, I don't have eight cats, but I probably have eight insurance policies <laughs> and uh, my articles about insurance coverage, uh, because partly because Texas is now starting to emerge as a place that may not be insurable. Mm -hmm. And that's going to hit home for for a lot of us. This article is from the BBC, and yet the opening example is right here out of Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. And and actually, uh, they're quoting one of our colleagues here who works at Go Austin, and her flood insurance went up this year from $450 to almost $2,000. Wow. And she's going to have to move out of her neighborhood that she's grown up in, where her whole community is. And it's not just the insurance alone, but that was kind of the breaking factor. And the article kind of goes into a study that uh, recently came out talking about just the cost of all of this natural, all the natural disasters that are happening and how um, insurance companies can't keep up. And so for those of you who hadn't heard, Last few years, there have been companies that we've all heard of, Allstate, State Farm, Farmers Insurance. They are no longer even selling policies in California. The mm-hmm. new homeowners are condo owners even. In Florida, some of the companies are starting to, to leave the state. It says there's at least a dozen insurers who are no longer offering their policies there. And so California and Florida, it's already happening. But then kind of accompanying this, this article is a study about which communities are most vulnerable, and Texas is in the headlines on wind and flood and hail damage. Yeah, we just had a terrible hailstorm here. But you know, it's still very early in the season, and we're just it's starting to become very normal. I have a friend who just got her car back from fixing the hail damage from the last storm, and now she has to take it back again. Wow! Wow! <laughs> the other kind of factor they point out is these these effects uh, do fall disproportionately on socially vulnerable populations, especially, um, and we see it here where we live in Central Texas. Communities that are more susceptible to flood tend to be lower income communities, and that that plays out all over the country. They also note though that real estate prices keep rising. And, you know, that the market hasn't really adjusted to factor in climate risk. And so just kind of pointing it out that even though those houses are on the coast are still for sale and they're still beyond our reach, they're also on the map to go underwater or be obliterated by wind and that there's still a mismatch here. But overnight, these insurers are saying they're packing up their bags and they're leaving whole states behind and we could be next. So, all right. So you got some good news? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, it's speaking of wildfire, um, you know, those that that horrible wild wildfire. Oh, I'm going to say wildflower at some point today. <laughs> wildfire up in the Panhandle, yes, the, the largest um, wildfire in Texas history. Um, yeah, just just terrible. Also, yeah. kind of a crazy time of year for that right. to happen. Right. And, and a lot of these wildfires come to be in, in in combination with like greater than average rainfall, which allows a bunch of growth. And then it gets dry, like through a flash drought, and then boom, you know, here comes here comes a spark. Mm. Um, so it's so a lot of ter- a lot of terrible things with that that fire. However, um, in in Borger, um, they actually did a prescribed burn several months before that fire. Mm. And the folks up there believe that it was that prescribed burn that kept the city from being um, affected by that wildfire. And it's, I guess it's, it's uh, not particularly uplifting, but, but it's uplifting <laughs> in the sense that, you know, there's, there's a adaptation or response to, you know, what's coming. I'm not saying this was specifically done because of climate change. It's, it was done in response to a wildfire risk, but, but I think most people, 
see that there's a greater risk of wildfires with climate change, you know, where you have the rain, you know, it's getting rainier, you know, when it rains, it's rainier. And then when it's dry, it's drier, which yeah. is, which is a, not a good equation for minimizing wildfires. Well, in a lot of fires we see in the West, they, you know, the blame is really on sadly, sorry, smoky, but the fact that we've been so reluctant to use fire mm -hmm. as a tool, all that understory is overgrown and uh, systems aren't operating naturally anymore. So using fire as a tool would be a way to keep things from being so catastrophic. And I understand it being controversial because you think about what happened in yeah, what, they North, can get away. northeastern New Mexico. Was, that was last year. Oh, we had one here in Bastrop um, uh, not uh, oh, too long right, ago. Oh, that's yeah, right. That's right. Yeah. I wish I could find a fun segue, but <laughs> this might be a solution to your kitten problem. Okay. Burmese pythons. What? <laughs> <laughs> that's Actually, terrible. There is a good segue here for ranching. So okay. there's a study that just came out of um, Australia that's suggesting that we should start ranching pythons. Oh, yes, I saw Have that. Have you seen this? Yeah. So for those of you that don't know, a couple of pet pythons were released into the Everglades, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. And they are at, they've they absolutely run rampant. The article talks about it's the worst it could be, you know, that, that there's no going back on this. So there's pythons everywhere in the Everglades and they're killing all sorts of animals, bunnies, birds, even alligators. And um, so that's the bummer part. <laughs> Skip to the happy part. I mean, no happy. Kittens. No kittens. <laughs> I know. Well, they, yeah, they do talk about, um, they are talking about the advantages of using these pythons as a food source. And apparently they're very energy efficient. They, they're very high protein. They have what they're low fat. If we were to switch to eating them, it would really lighten the impact of the traditional ranching that, that we do with cattle, which are resource intensive and, and gaseous, as we've talked about here. And there are countries where snake is eaten regularly, like Vietnam, but uh, it does go on to say that not everyone's a big fan. <laughs> 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 so it has the texture of calamari and it tastes kind of like alligator. Which but, tastes like chicken, right? Right, right? I mean, kind right, of. kind of. <laughs> Um, but they only eat once a week. They don't need to drink water. They are cold blooded, so they can sort of heat themselves up in the sun. They eat the things that we don't like to eat. They go into some detail about that. I'll skip that. But they basically say they're they're long, thin garbage bags, recycling a lot of waste. <laughs> and they go into a lot of details about how this could work. It's kind of interesting. But yeah, they say some hunt some hunters in you know in in Florida, you can be paid for hunting them. Um, and hmm. some people have tried to eat it, even though apparently that's not legal, but they, uh, here's the quote. It's so chewy. I spit it out. And hmm. here's another one. I'll skip it. <laughs> they do talk about, they are using their, their skin for Apple watch bands. So maybe that's the way you can help. Okay. <laughs> and these were academics that recommended this. Yeah, so yeah. This is why people love academics, right? right? Yeah. So, so they're proposing that people actually raise these in a controlled way. Yes. S snake farm. Snake <laughs> farm. There's a great song. We should link to that. Snake farm. It just sounds nasty. Snake farm. Bird in my I mean, it is a weird story, but it does kind of, um, again, talk about how we may have to adapt some of the things mm -hmm. that we're used to, you know? Yeah, we oh. may just be eating uh, snakes and jellyfish in the future. And petting a lot of cats, it yeah. sounds like. Uh, yeah, <laughs> which is, you know, I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> well, Robert, before we get started on the interviews, I'd love to know, what do you know about Earth Day? Um, I, I know it's been around a while. Um, probably going back to the uh, 60s or the 70s. Yeah. Um, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> did I get it? <laughs> um, you know, I kind of hear some of that early or late 60s, early 70s hippie music kind of along with it. <laughs> um, but uh, um, I think it was also in response to um, really kind of the United States um, reaching a carrying capacity in many ways and some things. So like, so there were various things happening to the environment that were not good, you know, with water pollution and, 
and air pollution. And so, so I know it's in April. April 22nd. April 22nd. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's in April um, every year. And, uh, and, and now it's a worldwide thing. So. Great. Good did job. Did I do good? Okay. You did great. Did I get an A? You did Woo-hoo. great. Woo-hoo. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, weirdly, Earth Day has really uh, been a, an important milestone for me in my career and choosing my career. It was Earth Day 1990 that I really decided to commit my life to these causes. Oh, wow. So it plays wow. a really big role for me. And I um, went on to organize Earth Day at Texas A&M and, wow. and did that for the Brazos Valley community for a number of years and just really get a lot of inspiration and uh, renewal every time. Like even today, it's just so wonderful seeing all the people doing good work in this community. And I think it just re-energizes me for the year every year. So it's my favorite holiday. And awesome. I'm so glad we could be out here today. But let me read a little synopsis um, that we found just on EarthDay.org to give everybody a sense of the history. It's not all hippies. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, just, just but no, you're right. And I think there was some a whole, good music. There was some good yeah, music. Also good there. music. Yeah. That's right. Um, here's the quote. So groups that had been fighting individually against different issues like oil spills, polluting factories, power plants, raw sewage being dumped into rivers, toxic dumps, pesticides, the loss of wilderness and the extinction of wildlife. They all united on Earth Day around some common values. And Earth Day 1970 achieved a rare political alignment of these folks and enlisted support from Republicans, Democrats, rich and poor, urban dwellers and farmers, businesses and labor leaders. And um, the quote here is, by the end of 1970, the first Earth Day led to the creation of the U.S. Environmental Protection Mm. Agency and the passage of other first of their kind environmental laws, including the National Environmental Education Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, and the Clean Air Act. Um, Two years later, there was also the Clean Water Act, and a year after that, the Endangered Species Act. So it was a really like rich time of environmental awareness and uh, people coming together with a lot of optimism and hope for change. So, And and interestingly enough, if I remember correctly, um, a a lot of that, that legislation that went before Congress um, was passed during Richard Nixon's. That's right. He signed all of those uh, laws. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so, so that was uh, you know he was very big into into the into the environment back then, um, and I suppose it was it was easier to be into the environment when you know rivers are catching on fire. There's so much pollution. Um, you know, the skies are filled with smog. You know, there's the acid rain that was happening. Um, and it's, I think it's easy to forget, um, particularly later generations, you know, all this good work that happened, right. what, 50 years ago, you know, how, how different things are today because of that, that legislation. Yeah, li- um, literally rivers were on fire. Literally, birds yeah, were right. dropping out of the sky from pesticides. Like it just, um, we we take it for granted some of these things now. But yeah, you're right, you're right. So there's been a lot of awareness raised by Earth Day, but it's also a time of celebration and just opened the door for a lot of good stuff, including this here today. Yeah. Texas. We're a Cobaltecan community of, uh, of people who have been on this land, according to archaeologists, for almost 14,000 years. But according to us, we've been here always. We believe that we originated right here in these springs, that we came up from the underworld and came up through these springs. So we are the Pilam of the Cobaltecan people. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful event. Oh. So for this special episode, Earth Day 2024, we're lucky enough to be here at Spring Lake 
at the San Marcos Earth Day celebration, which is co-sponsored by the Meadows Center for Water and the Environment, the Texas State Office of Sustainability, and Keep San Marcos Beautiful uh, from the city of San Marcos. And um, my favorite part of the celebration is the way that it starts. And so happy to get to share with you a little bit of the blessing that opens the festival. And we were honored to be able to um, witness the blessing given by Maria Rocha and Mario Garza, who are elders of the Neocon Garza Band of the Qualitecan people who have called this place at Spring Lake home since the beginning. All right, first up, we have Miranda Waite, our very own Deputy Director of Spring Lake Education here at the Meadows Center. She's been with us for just under 20 years and always plays an integral role in making this Earth Day celebration happen every year. Miranda, we'll just jump right in. For everyone that's unfamiliar, how would you describe your role here at the Meadows Center? My role here at the Meadows Center is to run the daily operations of the Class Bottom Boat Tours and the field trips and events that we host here. So make sure that the glass boats are running and that the field trips are fun. This is my main goal. On those field trips, your team really gets to educate the public on climate. When it comes to climate education, what are some of the challenges your team faces? And have you noticed any shifts in those challenges over the years? I'm not seeing quite as much anymore, but definitely people just are scared of using the word climate change in schools. It's still kind of an issue. I think more in public schools and private schools, we do have a um, climate explorers field trip that we offer. And I, I'm noticing that more private schools book it over um, public schools. But our goal is to basically make students more mindful about their surroundings and the environment and kind of letting them see the changes for themselves. I definitely think it's become more normal to talk about it people are more willing and excited to kind of approach those topics. There's been this like very negative kind of connotation when, you, when people say, think of climate change, they, they like associate it with global warming and like all these things that are very um, triggering for some. I think now people are realizing that there are more extremes that are happening and we can teach students on different ways to help decrease the rate of change in weather and the extremes. Mindfulness, like out in the environment, that's become very trendy. People like learning different techniques to become more connected to nature and what's around them. Um, and so it's just becoming more normalized, which is awesome. And since you've been with the Meadow Center so long, I'm curious to know what daily challenges has climate change posed to your team day to day over the years? Weather and the amount of rain that we've had. Whenever we have these extreme rainfall events, it can turn into chaos very quickly if we have lots of rain. We are in a flash flood area, and I have been here when the parking lot is even with the lake. And so when you have boats that are on top of the water and the docks are under the water, then you have to move the boats when the lake is super high. It is something that we have to be aware of. And since the boats are old, we have to cover the boats, um, the wooden boats, to make sure that they don't get filled up with water. And so there's just a lot that goes into it whenever there's extreme rain in the forecast. And then the opposite, when we don't have rain, um, currently we can't go down to our dock over by Kirby Lane because there's not enough water in the lake and uh, the boats won't make it. So. Um, we're restricted on what we can do as well. Yeah, this drought's a little scary. It's been going on now for three years. It's three years on the heel of the previous drought of record. Uh, we very well may be in our own drought of record or a new drought of record on top of it. And then as you note, you know, we're gonna get it from both sides. We're gonna be more susceptible to flooding and we're gonna be more susceptible to drought going forward. So. Since we're gathered here for Earth Day, what does Earth Day mean to you? Earth Day is my favorite holiday. It's, a, it's an amazing opportunity just to get a lot of really cool organizations together. When we host Earth Day here at the Meadows Center, it's just a time for the community to get together 
it's just a cool opportunity for Texas State and um, the city to host something together and it being very natural. That's probably my favorite thing about Earth Day here in San Marcos. I love that answer because Earth Day is, as you know, as I've already mentioned, Earth Day is also my favorite holiday. Miranda, do you have any recommendations or tips for our listeners to make every day Earth Day? Conserving water because it's our most limited resource and it's something that we really need to protect, especially out here in the Texas Hill Country. I basically just stop watering my lawn and my plants um, whenever we're in extreme drought and um, using reusable containers especially here in San Marcos. San Marcos just put a can ban um, on the river. So definitely keeping your cup that you can refill is important. And then also just being mindful of where you buy things from. So buying locally instead of ordering online, that helps with emissions and packaging, all the things that you know require for something to get to you. So the less it has to travel, the better. Great response. There's certainly a lot we can do as as individuals you know it, it seems like maybe what one person does is 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 perhaps inconsequential but but all of us working together it, it truly does make a difference and make things make things better um that that's what i believe it's a great experience when we all come together and 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 care about taking care of our environment so Day, i guess it means you know honoring the earth which is you know our mother we live on her um, she's pretty important, so I think that it's a good day to pay our respects. And we're happy to have with us Trey Mixon with Lou Triton, aka Ozarka, and uh, w- welcome to the Meadow Center and to Earth Day. We're so happy to have you here um, as a as a major sponsor and and also here in person. Well, thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. This has got to be the best place on earth. You know, we, we, we love our relationship with the Meadow Center and, and I couldn't think of any way to celebrate people, the planet, or, or see the engagement with the community that's going on outside with the uh, festival today. So just great job and I'm just glad to be here. I tell folks you're the only groundwater pumpers I know that are truly concerned about keeping spring flows flowing. So thanks for all you do in supporting us as, as well as you know keeping springs flowing. Yeah, it's great great to be here at the Headwaters to hear some of the origin story and the blessing and uh, Blue Triton and Ozark. We're, we're trying to build a better water company, you know, and support healthy hydration for everybody everywhere all the time. So we were glad to help out with the with the tumblers and the new ordinance. It's going to really help with the uh, the challenges here at the Headwaters. But what, what a great facility, really. So, so what does taking care of Texas mean to, to your company on a, on a day like Earth Day? On, on Earth Day especially, you know, we want to have an opportunity to pause, reflect, take in this, this wonderful sanctuary that's right here in the midst of, you know, Texas State and the wonderful city of San Marcos and, and really engage and, and have that opportunity to think about how we take care of people, how we take care of the planet, how we conserve resources. It's so great to have you here. You know, our partnership with Ozarka and Blue Triton has been going, what, like five years now? Five years strong, I think? You, you may need to get the Wayback Machine. I think it started <laughs> seven years ago. Seven years. With the initial conversations, and then we had a, a fantastic opportunity to, you know, engage. What we hear everywhere we go is education and awareness of, about water is, is the biggest, you know, important shared challenge. And so to kick off with y'all as thought leaders at the forefront with the uh, Grand water challenges yes. and, and going back and then the work uh, along with our, our AWS type certification and growing that relationship and supporting that citizen science education with the stream team and mm-hmm. then broadening that with our three-year partnership now with Blue Triton Sustainability on the leadership side, uh, Ozarka on the stream team side and our brand team, you know, supporting some of the wetland restoration work is, you know, we're just, we're just glad to be a small part of it, really. You're a huge part of it for us here and, and, and part of almost everything we're doing now here at the Meadows Center. So we just can't celebrate enough. So sustainability is key for Earth Day and with your, your Made Better brand dedicated to sustainability, you know, but how would you describe your company's relationship to yeah. water resources and sustainability? Well, well, the Made Better campaign is, is really interesting because it started with a uh, pledge 
to recycle, to uh, engage with a bottle donation for water access yeah. for folks is where it started and, and it's broadened, right? So now we're tied in with Keep Texas Beautiful, Keep America Beautiful, uh, Folds of Honor, supporting some of our veteran communities. What we're finding is that there are people all across the country that are passionate about water and conservation, and we're trying to engage with them everywhere. And that's what Made Better is trying to do, to find those relationships to a heightened awareness and, and you know get everybody focused on that system sustainability piece. Uh, there's going to be, what, another 20 million people coming to Texas <laughs> yes. coming up. Yeah. So we yeah. want to be ready for that. And we know that, you know, the, the leadership from the Meadow Center is, is the reason that Texans are going to have water in the future. So. Well, it's a great segue to my question, which, you know, this podcast is focused on climate change, but, you know, really we're trying to talk to people about what does that mean for our lives here as Texans? And how are y'all preparing for what looks like another year of drought, potentially? or just in general, some of those challenges with the number of people coming and right. water supplies being more scarce. Well, well, we've been very blessed so far in the areas where our sites are located and operated. Uh, we've actually been fairly fairly consistent or above annual precip so oh, far. Great. You know, we're, oh, great. we're, uh, we're concerned and watching the uh, evolution of, of the drought coming from Southwest Texas. We try to look at the past to uh, predict the future, but the best thing we can do is make sure every day we're engaged in land management practices, engaged in water conservation practices to uh, improve quality and quantity where we operate and, uh, Stay tuned. The company oh. has some innovative and exciting <laughs> announcements uh, with uh, where we're headed between now and 2030. You know, it's it's what we do every day. It's it's not, I mean, it's in the definition, right? Sustainability. Right. It's right. not something you can do once a quarter. It's, you have to do it every single day. And, and you know, we've got uh, uh, almost 1,200 employees here in the state. Uh, that make our fabulous spring water products and drinking water products. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we're, we want to be better and, and we're engaging in that way. But you mentioned land management. You know, you guys do have this holistic approach to we, we do to we, groundwater. Um, we try to take care of it, just like uh, you know, Carrie was showing us earlier. Some of the restoration projects and challenges with, e even if it's just particulate from sedimentation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That directly affects water quality. Some of the sensitive species here at Spring Lake, and it's no different. It's just a you know, everywhere has its own biodiversity, and we want to make sure that we're improving that. You know, not only for biology and ecology, but you know, wild life habitat prohibitions so that you know we're not applying fertilizers herbicides pesticides or anything else uh, and always looking to the future and you know the EPA announcement recently on on the perfluorinated uh, in the last right. week so right. always trying to look at what's coming up the next 20 years and how do we prepare for that I don't control the weather but <laughs> you know, we want to be ready for it let so. us know when you do that exactly <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you're managing essentially from from drop to drink, so rain exactly. drop all the way to the drink, and uh, and, that, and that's something you know all of us can take a, a lesson from. D do you have any any tips to help our listeners make Earth Day every day? Get active, be passionate, recycle, and and join in anywhere you can. And, and again, uh, join the stream team, get involved in your local watershed. We support education everywhere we can. I think y'all know we've been been really happy to partner the last several years and include our Every Drop Count scholarship here with Texas State mm -hmm. and Meadows. You know, because this is where the future water leaders are coming from. In addition, we've had. You know, over the last 20 years, over half a million dollars in local scholarships. We partner with Don't Mess With Texas and their scholarship fund, you know, and uh, we're, we're excited. We, we just announced uh, the press release is coming out. We were excited to collaborate with uh, Texan by Nature and the Texas Water Action Collaborative. Uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife and DU for the Old Sabine Bottom Beaver Slough Wetland Restoration. I, you know, we're, we're trying That's and we, we know there's high water stress and we know there's population coming and we want to. We want to do all the, the things we can to conserve in the areas where we operate. Stay tuned. How exciting. Yes. Exciting. And, and I'm glad you mentioned the, the Every Drop Counts scholarship because those are transformational scholarships for students here at Texas State University. But that's another way that Ozarka and Blue Triton is supporting water and springs because um, that's helping students get their degrees in, in environmental studies, water resources. And, and a lot of that has benefited research in springs. Well, I, I firmly believe that those are the, the, the students and, and the people here engaged at Texas State and, and Meadows are going to be the ones that solve Texas water future, right? And so uh, we couldn't think of any place better to uh, support education and awareness with the wonderful facilities here at Spring Lake. It's our honor to be a small part of it. It really is. 
Well, we're so honored to have you with us today. Thank you for, for all that you do. And uh, Happy Earth Day. Yes, hey, Gary. Happy yes. Earth Day to you. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Glad to be here. That's awesome. So Earth Day means a lot to me because it really shows just how much everybody actually cares about changing our Earth for the better. I'm an Earth citizen. Earth is my home. So in a sense, every day in my life is an Earth Day. Dedicating um, some of our time every week to helping the environment and volunteering, that's how we, you know, make every day Earth Day. I'm Emma Parsley is here from the Texas State Office of Sustainability, and you're co-hosting Earth Day with us this year, is that right? Yes, ma'am. Excited to be here. Well, awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about what your office does at Texas State? What kind of things do you do around campus? Yeah, absolutely. I essentially at the Office of Sustainability, we manage several different programs, um, all focused on different topics of sustainability. So from community outreach to online education to working with our folks from facilities, utilities, outdoor education, wow. whatever it may be. <laughs> I like to have my hands in many buckets, to say the <laughs> least. Awesome. Well. You know, Texas State lays claim to having the most beautiful campus in the state. Mm -hmm. We're at this you know, fantastic transition from the, I'm sorry, I got to go geography here, <laughs> Gulf Coastal Plain and the hill country and the beautiful hills. And then, of course, you know, we, we have a literally have a river born on campus mm -hmm. that then flows through campus. Campus, I guess, really is designated as a sensitive area. And so how can local San Martians and, and others uh, help to protect these areas. There's many ways that individuals can help protect our beautiful area. And I agree, we do have the most beautiful campus <laughs> in the nation. I am a double graduate from Texas State, okay. so I hold great pride in this campus. And I believe everyone should have great pride of this area just because it is so ecologically diverse and unique. Um, one of the ways is be mindful about your water use and water consumption. I believe we're in stage three drought right now. so conserve your water as much as you can. Other aspects are be mindful of your litter. If you see litter on the ground, go ahead and pick it up here, because here. it yeah. is everyone's job to keep this planet, this area as beautiful as possible, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, when, and when you see litter on campus, like on a sidewalk, mm -hmm. where does it go after a rain? Yeah. It goes right into our storm channels, which means right into our river. Exactly. Mm -hmm. right. We want to keep that water as clean as possible. It's not just for our own health, but for our, the health of our endangered species and for our natives that are in and out of the water, of course. Thank you for everything you do. And I know you think about sustainability every day, but mm -hmm. what's special about Earth Day? I'd love to know, can I just, how does your office look at Earth Day? And, and tell us what, why you think it's a special day. To me, it's really special because it gives us a time to just take a step back and really look at the nature around us um, and really identify the connection that humans have with the environment. I mean, especially when we have the Indigenous Cultures Institute out here, they are great educators about our spiritual connections um, to Mother Nature. And regardless what paths you may walk, whether it be spiritual, religious, we all have some affiliation with nature. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is a spiritual sacred ground that really resonates with me deeply. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being here today and part of it all. Of course. I'm happy to be here. It's <laughs> one of my favorite days. It's my favorite holiday. And mine too. <laughs> we were just talking about that. So, so how can students, faculty, and staff get involved with the Office of Sustainability? So we have several different volunteer opportunities. Um, students can actually apply for the Sustainability Graduation Cord, and the way that they can yeah. earn that is through volunteer opportunities and taking sustainability-focused classes. Mm -hmm. So the Sustainability Studies Program here on campus, which is also very unique to Texas State, mm -hmm. um, is open to undergraduates as a minor, and graduate students can do that as their master's program. I'm also one of the products of that program. <laughs> I highly recommend it. Awesome. Uh, so that's good ways um, for students to get involved, um, volunteering efforts and academics, and then faculty and staff. Um, use your wellness hours. Really take time to take a break from work and take a walk around the river, take a walk around our environment, and give yourself some green space and give yourself a screen break. What a great reminder. Yeah, for those of you listening, uh, Texas State gives up to two and a half hours a week for staff to have wellness time. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. great. Well, your tip for taking wellness time at the river was a great one. Do you have any other tips for making everyday Earth Day? Oh, man. Um, let's see here. Support your local economy. Um, buy local, um, bring you that lunch to work, reduce your waste at all times, mm -hmm. and reuse that refillable water bottle. Don't use that plastic water bottle, please. And if you do, recycle it. 
That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yes. And thank you for putting on this beautiful Earth Day festival. Absolutely. So it is my pleasure. <laughs> Earth Day is not just about celebrating Earth itself or the people that codified it, but our collective ability as a population, as authors, as policymakers, educators, community members, CEOs, investors, researchers, as artists, designers, consumers, innovators, as individuals to affect positive shifts in the health of our environment through daily decision making ordinary actions, and watershed landmark decisions alike. So we can keep enjoying our life on this planet as much as we can for as long as we can. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's let's read a poem for Earth Day. This poem I, I, I got from Academy of American Poets. They had a collection of Earth Day poems. Nice. And uh, this is by a poet named Francisco X. Alarcón. And he's, he's known as a Chicano poet. He's uh, one of the first poets to receive a lot of national recognition for writing in both English and Spanish. Mm. I'm going to read his poem in English, but, <laughs> but, but actually it's in English, wow. Spanish, and Nahuatl, which is the language of the Aztecs. Wow back when you know, Coronado first landed in, uh, in what we know and, and love today is Mexico. Uh, Francisco was actually born in California, in Wilmington, California, and then moved to Guadalajara, Mexico when he was six, and then moved back to the United States. And his grandmother was a native speaker of Nahuatl. So oh, this, wow. is, this is why he also writes in that that language. And I learned that Nahuatl was still being spoken, um, particularly up in the mountain regions of Mexico. Um, so this poem is called Flower Song. And, uh, and here we go. Every tree, a brother, every hill, a pyramid, a holy spot, every valley, a poem in Huachil, in Huicat, flower and song. Every cloud a prayer, every raindrop a miracle. Everybody a seashore, a memory at once lost and found. We all together, fireflies in the night, dreaming up the cosmos. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, Robert, happy Earth Day. You too, Carrie. And happy Earth Day to all of you. Until we get to see you again, I hope you all get outside and get yourself connected with nature and keep yourselves charged up for the good fight. Every raindrop is a miracle. It is. Thank you all for being with us for another climate conversation. We hope you can take this information with you into your everyday life to help spread the knowledge and understanding of climate topics and their effects. This podcast would certainly not be what it is without listeners like you. If you're listening through Spotify, take a quick moment to help us out and engage with the quiz and poll we've attached to this episode. And be sure to check the show notes for helpful links and resources. Thank you to our funders for the Fahrenheit 140 podcast, both the Meadows Foundation and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. We'd also like to thank our communications team, Anna Huff and Sarah Wingfield. If you'd like to learn more about the Meadow Center for Water and the Environment and how to visit our vital spring lake for a ride in a glass bottom boat here in San Marcos, Texas, be sure to visit our website, meadowcenter.txst.edu. We have a number of climate resources there, including free lesson plans for your K through 12 curricula. Sign up for our newsletters to get news, updates, and event opportunities hot off the press. I'm Robert Mace. And I'm Carrie Thompson. Thanks for being part of the conversation. 